already engaged in discussion, the disciples ask him what seemed to them a fairly obvious question. Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or his parents' sin? Such things as blindness and disability were always assumed to be the result of sin in that person's life. That way, they could more easily be discounted in society. It was a kind of a karma, like, you get what you deserve kind of thinking. I think we always have to be somewhat aware of that lingering tendency, even today. It's often sort of lurking in the shadows of our collective mind. Well, Jesus sets them straight very forcefully, quickly dispelling the primitive motion that disease is the cosmic effect of sin in a person's life. Now, we are not told that the man asks anything of Jesus. Perhaps, hearing the voices of the disciples, he just lifts his cup up toward them, asking for alms. In any case, Jesus, after smearing the mud on the man's eyes, asks him to do something, to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Perhaps often overlooked is the fact that the man obeyed Jesus. He simply got the went. Did he have any idea why Jesus had told him to do this? Well, we really don't know. Perhaps he hoped that something good would come of it. In any case, the important thing is that he did what Jesus asked him to do. And as a result, his eyes were opened. And he could see. For the first time, he could see. I believe that we are all born blind every one of us. And I think that many people have, or have had, or will have, some type of encounter with Jesus, wherein their eyes were opened, so to speak. Perhaps they didn't even recognize it, or perhaps they couldn't name it. Perhaps it was dramatic, Though I venture to say that more times than not, it is not a dramatic occurrence. But at some time in their life, the perspective changed. Things that had been up to that moment seen, seen of supreme importance began to move in the background. And the screen was filled with a different light, a different image. And the priorities were shifted. There was new ground to be covered, new paths to explore. Of course, there are many encounters, or conversions, as we could call them, that are well defined in their moment and their place. Some are quite dramatic. Personally, I think that God is very much a respecter of persons and personalities. If we need to be hit on the head, so to speak, he's quite willing to accommodate that. <laughs> and I have to admit that in writing this sermon, I was forced to come to terms with John's gospel. I struggled as I tried to scoot around it. I tried to avoid the blunt truth that the evangelist is so absolutely immovable about. I tried to be diffident in the language and soft pedal what I was encountering. But I was up against a wall. 30 feet high, a thousand miles long, it might as well. The Gospel of John has always been my favorite of the four Gospels. No, it does not contain many of the favorite settings and scenes that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have. We have no birth story. We have no shepherds, no angels. We have no childhood story. No. 
John brings us immediately to the man, Jesus. Fully formed, fully aware of who he is, and of his mission, and of his destiny. But to me, John's gospel has always been bathed in light, glorious, and clearly spoken, but slightly inaccessible. <laughs> so full of truth that it is just ever so slightly beyond my grasp. And may I be so bold, beyond that a lot of us. What do I mean when I say I was forced to come to terms with John's gospel? The Christian church takes its name and identity from Jesus Christ, obviously. We state our belief in Jesus in our baptismal covenant and in our creed. And we consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus. And, as best we can, we try to do the good works for others that we are called to do. And I really believe that this parish, Good Shepherd, is absolutely exemplary in its loving outreach to others in all ages and stages of life. It is truly a shining example of Christian service. But what is it about this gospel that won't let me sit comfortably with following Jesus and obeying his injunction to follow him? Won't let me sit comfortably with just that, following Jesus and obeying that injunction. John simply won't be content with that. He continually invites and insists and commands that we go deeper than that. In the very first chapter of John, he insists that the Word, the Word which created the world and all things that we know of, became flesh. Jesus, the Son of God, or as John speaks of him, the Word made flesh. And further, that by our belief in baptism, he lives in us, in each one of us. This is different. This is personal. This is not simply an ascent to an abstract belief. It is not an intellectual exercise. Like, I believe in peace, or I believe in justice. No. The symbolism of baptism is death and rebirth. We die to our own selfishness. That is, living for ourselves and our own wants and desires. And we are reborn with the Spirit of Christ living in and through us. Jesus, alive in us, in you and me. I believe that this is why Jesus left us with a very tangible, very personal, very physical memorial of himself in the Eucharistic meal. There is nothing more tangible, nothing more physically real than the acts of eating and drinking. And he said, this is my body and this is my blood as he gave it to them. This was a promise that he would be with them in the bread and in the wine as they took it in his name. A promise. This is why we come here every Sunday, to be fed in so many ways. We are fed in our minds through the scriptures, the very word of God. 
We are fed in our bodies through the Eucharist, the very body and blood of Christ. This is really quite a remarkable thing, that each Sunday we have the opportunity to connect physically with Jesus, to be fed as his disciples were, with his body and blood. And we are fed in our fellowship with sharing the love and the joy of Christ in each other and learning how Jesus has reached out through us to others, others who are in need of the touch of Jesus' love. So being a Christian, belonging to Christ, is a very physical thing. The stories of Jesus and his dealings with his disciples and with people who followed him are all very physical. He healed them, or he ate with them. Only one story that we have of him has it standing in front of a large crowd, the Sermon on the Mount. And even in that story, he fed them. In Jesus, heaven and earth are joined together. What we insist are two different realms, the physical and the spiritual, are one. In that sense, Jesus is the door the door between the two realms. I said that I believe that we are all born blind. We all have needed Jesus to pull away the screen that separates our earthly vision from the heavenly or eternal vision. What we are confronted with in John's Gospel is the truth that on the other side of that screen or door, however we want to put it, is not some indefinable, mysterious, other world, reminiscent of Hollywood's greatest special effects. No. When we open that door, there is Jesus. John's Gospel is unique in that it gives us the clearest picture of Jesus as human and divine. He is the Logos, the Word made flesh. He is the connection by which we too may access the divine while still in our earthly body. More than being merely followers of Jesus, as Christians, we are carriers of Jesus. I know we all have heard at some time in our lives, maybe as children, that Jesus has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet. We are vessels of Jesus' presence and power. Awesome. But that's what he wants of us. That's what we are to be and to do. The thing that is unique about all of this, that sets it quite apart, from many other practices of spirituality and religion is, of course, the person of Jesus. In Jesus, we encounter not a mystical void of some kind or a cosmic journey, but a person. The person of Christ. It is Jesus Christ who is the guide, who directs us, who through us heals and comforts. So the Word became flesh. He came to dwell among us, and we saw His glory, such glory as befits the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Amen. <laughs>